Let's face it, this is a weird series. Both teams have had massive blowouts, and that's what happens when you have two diametrically opposing styles of play clashing every other day of the week. At times, it looks like the Warriors' three-point shooting will completely overwhelm this Lakers team, who don't have the personnel to defend well enough. And at other times, the Lakers so thoroughly dominate the Warriors that you wonder if Golden State should just stop shooting shots near the basket altogether. To make matters even weirder, LeBron James did not even shoot the ball in the first quarter and went 13 minutes of playing time without looking at the basket as the Warriors built an 11-point lead. It turns out you can point a finger at one of his teammates to explain why. Jared Vanderbilt is offensively challenged, and as a result, his defender will often ignore him to shadow LeBron. Let's look at what LeBron sees as he begins his attack. A chance to attack Curry in the pick and roll, but there's Jamichael Green ignoring Vanderbilt to hover in the lane until LeBron's close enough to rotate fully. This leaves Clay splitting the difference between the wing and the corner, but look how hard LeBron throws this pass. Clay never had a chance as D'Angelo Russell benefited the most. They try cutting Vanderbilt out of the strong side corner, but it just lets Jamichael Green stay there to shadow LeBron while he works the mismatch with Curry. I don't understand why he's not hard doubling, and we see Vanderbilt trying to initiate contact with Draymond and doesn't get the benefit of the doubt as the Lakers come up empty. Here is Draymond ignoring Vanderbilt who wanders down to the baseline. I'm sure LeBron would love to go up over Klay Thompson, but with the long arms of Green waiting for him, he finds AD who helps generate free throws when Green's foot contacts Vanderbilt's foot causing him to lose balance. In transition, Poole is forced to pick up LeBron, which would be a light snack for him normally, but Looney decides to shadow off of Anthony Davis. Again, LeBron isn't going to force that shot and sees that Curry had rotated over to AD. The better play for the defense would have been for Wiggins to come over on this help and let Curry split the difference on the weak side. As a result, LeBron can just loft it up for an easy catch and finish. And early in the second, with LeBron bearing down on Wiggins, Draymond figures he can ignore Lonnie Walker and double LeBron. But Walker was a very good player for the Lakers in the regular season and reminded us all he should be getting minutes. D'Angelo Russell hadn't shot well from three in the playoffs until last night, so I get why Draymond would be willing to help on AD one pass away. The problem is, once you let a struggling shooter get a good look, it can unlock a lot more. And sure enough, as LeBron is presented with two defenders in transition, he fires another strike to a barely open D'Lo in the corner, and now you've got a hot shooter on your hands who can feed off the home crowd's energy. He was feeling it so much, he just torches a good defender in Klay Thompson with a behind-the-back dribble to reject the screen, then the sidestep shot fake, nice spin for added spice, and little fade from 12 feet, and I'm sure Rain Man wanted to ask what medication he was taking. In the last video, we discussed how poorly the Warriors defended this pin-down screen for AD coming out of the left corner. And last night, Draymond decided to top-lock Davis. This is the kind of positioning you use for a guy like Steph Curry who can fly off that pick and nail threes all day. Why on earth would you willfully give a cut to the biggest guy on the court straight to the basket? Of course, there was a foul on the screen, but this is much more a terrible defensive decision that led to a layup. Green does it again, so they tilt the angle of the screen to make it a slice cut. Wiggins must stay at the lane line to prevent another layup, and we don't properly appreciate these lasers LeBron can throw 30 feet on a rope, directly enabling Russell to attack the long closeout and open up a little fadeaway. And the Warriors should feel fortunate it wasn't an and one. One reason why it feels like this is a terrible matchup for the Lakers is the way they want to defend handoffs and pick and rolls when Anthony Davis is involved. He continued to sink way low into the paint against the perceived non-threat in Looney, but it leaves the defense with no contest of the three-point shot. I think what they're telling him to do is conserve energy earlier in the game by not stepping up, and then later in the game, use his mobility to meet the ball once it comes around the screen. It's just a little concerning if the Warriors take a huge lead early on all these open jumpers and have to expend a lot more energy later to come back. Notice how gassed both LeBron and AD are in this up and down sequence at the end of the third quarter. Darvinham needs to be concerned if they have to play a ton of minutes in a long series. But this game was a godsend as it allowed them to get an extra five or six minutes of rest. But even as the Warriors were building their 11 point lead in the second, there was plenty of evidence to prove that as a team, they were disjointed, emotionally uncentered, and so mistake prone that coaches everywhere were collectively asking if you could hear them shaking their head. Let's start with Steph Curry, who continues to try and challenge Anthony Davis in the lane even though we keep seeing these shots get blocked. 
Maybe Vanderbilt hits him in the head here, but it's the decision to shoot a finger roll floater that's the real issue. He tries to do the same thing by challenging LeBron in the lane without an advantage, and he's got to know that these forays toward the basket rarely end up going well for him. Even something subtle like this caught my eye. On their vaunted low post split, Curry collapses the defense but then decides to float this pass to Wiggins. It takes almost two seconds to get there, eliminating the open shot he could have had. Compare this to the LeBron fastballs and you have to wonder why he did it. Same thing here as he's wide open but Curry just fires the pass out of bounds. Normally when you're on the fast break, it's a good idea to always watch the ball. Why is Clay not looking back? But then for Curry to not realize this and try and throw a lefty bounce pass across the court from 25 feet away is all sorts of head scratching and just a symbol for the beginning of the end. If those were the only mistakes, then maybe the Warriors survive and maintain their lead. But no, the hits kept coming. Draymond wants to Michael to lift earlier and maybe that would have helped since he just steps out of bounds. The Warriors turn a surefire advantage into a turnover as Clay feels pressure from behind and throws this pass more to Anthony Davis than to Kevon Looney. Dante DiVincenzo has to do something with it as the clock winds down and while trying to initiate contact with the defender, ends up getting stripped by a guy who wasn't even facing him. Jordan Poole has been borderline unplayable for much of the series, and if you look at the direction Lonnie Walker's arm was moving, then compare that to where the ball goes, I really think he just loses it on his own. And this one was enough to get me to walk away from the screen for a few seconds, as he just tries to go too fast on the delay move and doesn't remember to bring the ball with him into a terrible turnover, covered up because they had a bit of a lead. Moses Moody gets frustrated that he didn't get a call by jumping into 80's vertical space and ends up foolishly grabbing his foot for an automatic flagrant foul. Here's the moment the game completely changed. Down one, the Lakers get LeBron down low against Clay. You can see Coach Kerr wanting Wiggins to go double off the red hot Russell, but Clay gets a strip and it feels like Golden State would get this back under control. Now LeBron doesn't actually block this, but he closes so fast on Wiggins that he just blows the layup. On the way back down, LeBron is feeling it, calling for the ball early, but then cuts to the corner where Draymond picks him up, but not before he can take the lead back for good, finishing this incredible sequence and kickstarting a total devastation as the Lakers go on to outscore the Warriors 85-57 to the rest of the way. What this Lakers team lacks in three-point shooting and defense of the three-point shot, they make up for in defense of the paint, scoring around the basket, and most importantly, mental toughness and resilience. They've continued their dominance in free throw attempts, but what would you expect from a matchup between one team that simply gets to the line a lot versus a team that not only doesn't get a ton of free throws, but is also extremely foul prone? The Warriors, on the other hand, have a hard time letting things go and will compound the issue with silly technical fouls. I understand it's near impossible to guard Anthony Davis in the paint, so Green feels he needs to try and draw charges, but I'd much rather see him not try to take away a pass to this cutter and just focus on Davis, and Draymond is clearly not in his path when the collision occurs. Not only was this correctly overturned, but Green makes it worse by getting a technical foul. The Warriors became completely unglued the rest of the second quarter and never recovered. Nice pass from Curry to Looney, who just bounces it once, to Austin Reeves. Clay Thompson gets happy feet by splitting both of them before releasing the ball into a dribble. Easy traveling call. Defensively, they screw up a switch on a screening action that they themselves practically pioneered. As Wiggins gets screened, Curry doesn't switch with him and nobody goes with D'Lo, who gets another wide open look from downtown. When Clay realizes his shot is going to be short, he decides that holding his follow through and moving towards the basket might help instead of getting back on defense allowing a free run for Russell to hit Curry with a beautiful inside hand layup. He then gets caught with his hand in the cookie jar. While this is no longer a shooting foul, it's a clear cut foul. They're already in the bonus, so Reeves will shoot two free throws, and I have to imagine Clay is angry at himself with this reaction. DiVincenzo clearly switches on to Schroeder with the ball screen, but look how confused he gets when they throw it right back to his man, allowing a wide open three. Next, their offensive spacing completely falls apart. The high post split should never happen right in front of the post player for this very reason. Then Clay gets caught with a very unnecessary forearm push, which almost never gets called on a move like this, but you can see there is quite a bit of leverage gained with that off arm, even though it never extends into a straight arm. Then Jamichael Green, sitting on the bench, starts yelling at the baseline referee, who decides he's had enough and gives him a technical foul. Now you've got two angry greens in the bench together, negatively affecting the game while not even being on the floor. DiVincenzo continues his dizziness, and it was obvious in real time that he never got his feet completely out of the lane within three seconds, which is what the rule calls for and everyone knows this. 
This isn't even an issue of paying attention to detail. He just cut some corners and got caught. So that means they went from potentially stopping a LeBron post-up as the clock was about to wind down to allowing a good Lakers inbound play that gets AD the ball at the elbow right where he wants it, and Looney can't keep up with him as he gets a nice layup at the buzzer. The unforced errors kept going. Early in the third, Curry stops his drive, sees there's no angle to get it to Green, but throws the bad pass out of bounds anyway. Instead of making the easy pass to an open Wiggins with LeBron three steps behind, Draymond throws a blind, no-look pass to the corner that AD reads perfectly and deflects. Then, he almost throws away this ill-advised backdoor pass, credit to Curry for corralling it and finding Jermichael Green open for the dunk, who promptly blows it, and Clay can't even make a simple guard-to-wing pass without AD again there for a nice deflection. This all culminated in another attempt to take a charge from Draymond, and this type of charge has different rules because AD is a cutter receiving the pass versus dribbling to the basket. In this scenario, Draymond never gives AD an opportunity to avoid him as he catches this pass outside the area of the lane. I don't want to take anything away from what the Lakers are doing. They deserve to win this game primarily because they didn't make mistakes, didn't let the referees bother them, and continued to ruthlessly focus on their strengths. But this is a long series, and the question is, will the Warriors continue to shoot themselves in the foot? We all remember what happened after their Game 6 debacle against the Kings in the last round. Similar boneheaded plays led to a massive blowout loss, and then they rebounded in Game 7 to look like a well-coached team that destroyed the Kings. Will the Game 2 Warriors show up for Game 4 and beyond? It just feels to me like the Lakers are not built to beat the Warriors, but the Warriors are built to beat the Warriors. I wanna know if you can get to that.